minutes before eight. Let's talk about the London Underground and people taking a tumble. I have to say the numbers increase on Thursday or Friday, so that is possibly celebrating the weekend or the approach of the weekend. But at other times, do you know, it's not even occurred to me. I haven't used the London Underground, but I've used um, uh, uh, mainline trains. And I've had to walk down the steps at London Bridge. Of course, I hold the handrail. If, 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 well, let's see what you make of it. Carol's in Retford. Hi, Carol. You're on the radio. What are you going to tell me? Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Like you. Well, I haven't been on an underground no, I um, escalator for ages and ages. And they always used to be rackety. And I was always a bit weary of them and dark, mm. really. I haven't been, so I don't know what they're like today. I think it's just taking care, isn't it? And as for putting it down to certain days of the week, they are probably a bit still tipsy. Yep. I think you've got to take care. You've got to watch what your children are doing. But you know what? There's always a claim in something and people will be trying to get the people involved who own these, these, these stairs, these underground yep. places. They're always going to try and claim something, aren't they? I think you've got to watch what you're doing. You've got to hang on to the barrier. But yes, COVID is a worry. There was a story yesterday, time. Carol. We weren't able to get to it because it was quite a busy day. But the yeah. wearing of masks has dropped by 2.4 million people in six months. Yeah. So, so... 2.4 million uh, fewer people are wearing masks. Now, I, I, I have to say, I walked past a very big uh, London railway station the other day and I noticed people, if that had been six months ago, everybody coming out would have had a mask and taking it off and everyone going in would have had a mask and putting it on. It wasn't yeah. like that earlier this week. What's the story in Retford? I'm really disappointed in people all around where I go. The people aren't wearing masks. Some people are. And, and I, I will say it is the older generation that generally are doing that. Uh, for Sorry, are, are, are wearing them or are not? Just to clarify. What they you, are wearing they them, are, yes. Yep, but okay. I, a lot mm. of people aren't wearing them. That frightens me. Um, but also, I wear a mask all day at work. Um, now, when What do you do it, for a living, Carol? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what do you do for a living, Carol? I'm a housekeeper at a hospital. Right. Okay. And we have to wear them all day. Now, the point is how silly it sounds. It does affect everything. It, it seems to affect you hearing other people. And it certainly can affect your eyes because it irritates your eyes. It's not nowhere near, but it still seems to irritate your eyes. What, wearing, now, everyone, wearing a mask irritates your yeah, eyes? It does. Does it? It's yeah, it does. Okay. It's crazy, but it okay. does. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe I'm not wearing them properly, but um, no, it, it does, and it depends on the mask you're wearing as well. I mean, we have to wear hospital masks, so we're not wearing the silky ones that people can wear outside. But as for the escalators, again, people are always trying to claim something, aren't they? But can I just say something about going downstairs? Of I fell downstairs yeah. at work, oh God, and right, okay. um, I didn't have a mask because it wasn't COVID time. Um, it hadn't hit us, the pandemic then. Um, I wear bifocal glasses, you know, the ones with the lines. Uh, is that where you've got the powerful lenses at the bottom? of the glass is that is that roughly well it's a reading bit at the bottom okay. and it's a distance yeah. at the top my mum had now those, it was yeah. my own fault and i was coming downstairs i go down every single day and i was holding on to the side but i stepped down and i, I don't wear glasses i only wear them when i'm reading right you know what i mean right for some reason i'd left them on at lunchtime oh, Lord. Okay. i went down the stairs i looked down and oh, no. suddenly it wasn't focused properly oh, and i put my foot down and realized i wasn't on the step and i just went to the bottom well, you look after yourself, and thank you for the work you're doing in that sector. It's so important, the job you do. We really are hugely grateful. And as you say, Carol, everyone take care, not least on the London Underground, where people are not holding the handrail. But, of course, the London Underground is saying they are sanitising and cleaning as much as they possibly can. Carol, thanks. Uh, if we're talking about travel, let's broaden the conversation. Let's talk about possibly, possibly a green light, as it's called, for travel. Remember, we have that... Those traffic light codes in position in place at the moment. Let's turn to Conservative MP and Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Secretary of State George Eustace, who joins me now. Thank you for coming on the line. Are, are we inching towards some kind of normality for travel, Secretary of State? I doubt if you've even left the country over the last eighteen months. But what is the situation? Good no, morning. I, I, good morning. No, I, I haven't left the country. Well, why would you need to? In, in Camborne and exactly. Redruth, why would you need to leave the United Kingdom, Mr. Eustace? Absolutely. I had uh, a, a beautiful August in Cornwall. <laughs> but look, I think um, we've been trying to do everything we can to, to release some of the restrictions we've got in place. We know it's been particularly challenging for travel. You know, earlier this summer, we, we removed the need to quarantine for people coming back from amber countries, but retained uh, the need for there to be a PCR test so that we could do the necessary surveillance to, uh, to prevent there being a variant of concern. But I know people have um, uh, you know, suggested that some of that may be unnecessary and have asked for further simplifications. I think the Cabinet subcommittee that deals with this is looking at this issue, considering it later today. But no decisions have been made at the moment, despite some of the speculation. All right, let's move to other matters. 
Sitting in Westminster or New York or Sydney, we can see the benefit of this new pact. But it's a rather different picture possibly emanating from Paris and Beijing. Have we angered much of the rest of the world, in your view, Secretary of State? Well, I don't think um, that, that should be the case. Uh, France, of course, remains an incredibly uh, important uh, ally of the UK. They're We've talking betrayal, always... Mr Eustace. They're talking betrayal over trade and, and the building of these uh, submarines. Well, look, there has always been um, competition between shipyards around the world in different countries to uh, build ships and to build submarines. So that's not new. Um, and it's also not new, really, that the UK... Australia and uh, US work closely on things like, um, uh, you know, defence technology and intelligence and so on. Uh, we've uh, also, you know, applied to join the the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership down, uh, you know, in the Pacific. It's an area that's growing economically, and we want to strengthen our ties with countries like uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, and Japan and the US as we come out of the European Union. So it's all part of that, but I, I don't think it's um, um, something that should be seen as a, a threat to any of our other uh, allies. And of course, with China, China is a country that we're going to be working very closely with on things like climate change. And when we do COP26 later this year, and on my uh, particular brief uh, work that we want to do to uh, help nature and biodiversity internationally, we're really trying to get China uh, engaged in that agenda too. Well, good luck with that. Um, finally, can we explore something? Um, you're a good bloke. I like talking with you. But are you the man who needlessly killed Geronimo, the alpaca? Well, look, these cases are always difficult. And I had looked at the Geronimo case three years ago and, and a couple of other times uh, since, actually. But the, the truth is he had tested positive for bovine TB using a test called the Empiplex test, which is very rarely has false positives. Now, the owner at that point said she didn't, um, uh, you know, was unsure about the result. Would we give her a second test? Very, um, you know, we don't really do that. But the vets, to do her a favour, said, OK, we'll give you a second test. That also came back positive. And then she said, well, now I want a third test. And I think at that point, the danger of just relentlessly testing is you will at some point get a, what's called a false negative, And that is that it'll tell you it's clear when it's not. But so, uh, you know, difficult though it is, and I know she was very attached uh, to Geronimo, you know, we do have to maintain consistency in our fight against TB. Uh, and at post-mortem, they, you know, they did find TB-like lesions. Has the full post-mortem been made available to Geronimo's owner? Yes. So we had the post-mortem done. Uh, those results were shared with her. Uh, it, it showed that they have what they call you know, atypical lesions, TB-like lesions, uh, I think in the liver and in the uh, lymph as well, uh, not in the, the lungs. And I think on that basis, she's claimed that uh, that he didn't have TB, but there were TB-like lesions. Uh, and what we will now do is see whether we can culture TB from that, as we normally would in such cases, so that we can identify what strain of bovine TB it is. And you don't always get a successful culture, but it's certainly something they'll be trying over the next few months. So lastly, you and your colleagues uh, in the department, you, you are convinced that sadly, regrettably, it was the right course of action to take with this particular animal. Yes, and it is difficult. Uh, and, you know, it's the important thing to recognise is that you know, every week we sadly have to remove and slaughter about 500 cattle who test positive. Um, it's the positive test that we are looking for. Uh, you won't get a perfect test in every single instance. Indeed, with cattle, we actually, in some cases, use a, a sensitive test that we actually are very open. We'll sometimes give you a false positive in a, in a small number of cases. But, but if we're going to, um, you know, root out this disease, it's a very difficult, intractable disease to fight. We, you know, we do sadly need to take these decisions. Uh, and I know that this particular owner was very attached to Geronimo, but, you know, there, there are farmers up and down the country who suffer a similar, you know, heartbreak every week. My own family uh, who have cattle have, have lost, um, you know, um, show cattle people that you know excellent cattle they wanted to show through this uh through this um terrible disease and it, it is difficult uh, but but necessary so even 
even members of your family have had to have cattle uh, uh, put down, sadly, because of TB. Yes, uh, my, my family have a, a pedigree herd of South Devon cattle. They're wonderful, uh, gentle uh, animals native to the West Country. Um, but uh, yes, a few years ago, we had an outbreak of TB. And, you know, my father was very distraught because he lost one of the cows that he said was one of the best South Devon cows he'd ever seen. That's the nature of the disease. I sense it affects everyone. Thank you for your time as ever, Secretary of State. George Eustace appearing here on LBC, where the time is one minute after eight in the news with Holly Harris is next. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at just after 8 o'clock, changes to the UK's traffic light system on foreign travel 